We now move on to the transcendental deduction of the categories. A part of the book that is, by common consent, the most difficult, the most perplexing, but perhaps also the most radical, the most innovative and the most interesting. So it is definitely something that we will want to spend some time on. And, well, we'll have to spend some time on it because it's difficult, but also because there are actually two almost entirely different versions of it. So Kant wrote the Transcendental Deduction in the first edition, and he actually remarks, uh, as we have seen early on in the critique, that it cost him the most difficulty. And apparently he wasn't totally happy with it, because for the second B edition, Kant rewrote the main part of the Transcendental Deduction. Um, so the first section is almost the same, there are some changes at the end, but then what in the A edition are the second and third section are completely thrown out, completely rewritten in the B section. And in fact, the B version is really different, right? It's not just like exactly the same thing, but worded a little bit differently. It's really different. It seems to be a different argument. Um, at the very least, certain important elements of the argument of the story are very, very different in the B edition than they were in the A edition. So we will be looking at the common part of the two transcendental deductions first, and then we will look at the A version of the deduction and the B version of the deduction separately. So a transcendental deduction, what is that? Well, frankly, this is another of Kant's own terminological innovations uh, for the people of, of Kant's own time. This would have been just as baffling, I suppose, as it is for us. Luckily, Kant quickly tells us what he means by a transcendental deduction. And he tells us that he has taken this term from the legal profession, where a deduction is supposedly that part of the legal argument in which we show that there is a certain right, right? in which we do not dispute facts, but in which we show that there is a certain right. And so Kant tells us, and this is at B117, A85, that I therefore call the explanation of the way in which concepts can relate to objects a priori their transcendental deduction. I call the explanation of the way in which concepts can relate to objects a priori their transcendental deduction. Okay, what is Kant up to? Why does he want or why does he believe that he needs to give a transcendental deduction of the categories? After all, in the metaphysical deduction, like the clue chapter that we have just read, uh, in that chapter, Kant comes up with this table of the categories. He has shown us that if you have the, the functions of judgment, then when they are applied to objects, they supposedly, you know, appear as the categories. Isn't that all that we need, right? Why do we need more? Well, there's a couple of ways maybe to make that point. And before delving into Kant's own text more, into his own explanations more, uh, I would like to, to tell you two different stories that I hope can enlighten us about the need for a transcendental deduction. So here's the first story. Kant's main rivals are empiricism, in you know, the way that we find it in people like Locke and Berkeley and Hume on the one hand, and rationalism in the way that, that Kant knows it from the Leibniz-Wolf tradition, uh, on the other hand. And the one thing that Kant has criticized already about both the empiricist and the rationalist is that in very different ways, they sort of merge together, bring together, almost identify perception on the one hand and thinking, conceptual thought, on the other hand. Right? So the empiricist according to Kant, mistakes concepts for, you know, something that in a sense could just be given in perception, right? It's all the concepts are supposed to come from perception. Um, the very notion of sort of a, a logical judgment seems to, to have to follow, seems to have to be found just in the way that things are presented to us in sensibility. And as an example of that, maybe we can think of Hume, right? Hume tells us that we judge something to be true just in case it appears to us with 
with great vivacity and force. Right? So judgment is just a kind of way in which things appear in our sensibility. Okay, and Kant thinks that that is a mistake. On the other hand, the tradition stemming from Leibniz tells us that sensation is really just a confused kind of thinking. It is a kind of thinking in which everything runs together, in which the distinctions are not clearly made. Um, and so there too, right, these two things are in a sense really identified. Sensation turns out to be a special kind of thinking. Now, Kant's sort of main thing, one could say, in, in the critique up to now, sort of his main, well, I don't know if it's the main thing, but it's certainly a main thing, has been to make a sharp distinction between, on the one hand, sensibility, or more generally, intuition, and on the other hand, conceptual thought, right? And he has told us, for instance, that, that at least human cognition requires these two things to come together, right? Because... Um, uh, intuitions without concepts are blind and thoughts without content are empty, right? These are two very different things. Sensibility and the understanding are two totally different capacities uh, of, of human thinking. Uh, they're to two totally different mental capacities. And we need them both in order to have any cognition, right? In order to have anything that, that could even try to rise to the state of knowledge. Okay. But this means that Kant has generated a new problem for himself. Right? Kant has generated a new problem for himself. Or, if we think that Kant is right in making this distinction, maybe we would like to formulate this a little bit differently. Kant has seen that there is a problem that his predecessors didn't see, that they ignored, that, that, that didn't sort of, that never became clear to them. And the problem is, how can these two completely different things, right? Intuition, which in humans is sensibility on the one hand, and the understanding, which for us is conceptual judgment on the other hand, how can these two things ever come together? Or to say it in a slightly different way, why would the objects that are given to us in sensibility why would the objects that are given to us in sensibility be the right kind of things for our understanding to apply itself to? Doesn't that look like a bizarre coincidence if we cannot explain it? Right? If these really are two totally different things, the way that Kant has set things up, then this should give us pause. Why are the objects that are given to us in intuition appropriate things for our conceptual judgments to be about? Unless we have a story about that, unless we have an explanation about that. Um, well, there's this big question mark in our story about human cognition. And maybe worse than a big question mark, Kant is going to suggest in the text that, wow, if we can't solve this question mark, then we should really be suspicious about conceptual thought because maybe all those concepts don't really apply to anything at all, right? We have a nice table of the categories, but maybe those categories apply to nothing that is ever given in intuition. Okay, so we need to solve this. We need to solve this question mark. We need to show that the categories of the pure understanding the pure category, no, the categories of the pure understanding, the pure categories of the understanding, whatever. Um, we, the categories are always pure in a sense. Um, we need to show that the concepts of the understanding, the a priori concepts of the understanding, apply to the objects that are given to us in sensibility. And that is what the transcendental deduction is supposed to do. And of course, because Kant is the first, at least, in the way that, that you know, he receives the tradition. Um, in, in, in that tradition, he seems to be the first who, who makes this clear distinction between sensibility and the understanding. Uh, he is the first who really runs into this problem and has to solve it, and he can't rely on his predecessors. Right? There are no alternative theories already out there in the field. He has to start from zero, and of course, that is one of the reasons why he why this cost him so much difficulty, 
why he does it twice for the first and the second edition, um, and you know why it's generally a hard thing for us to understand. On top of that, the story that Kant is going to have to tell is going to be extremely abstract because it sort of has to connect these two fundamental ways in which human cognition works. And so we can suspect that things are going to be just as difficult as Kant tells us they will be. All right, that is the first story I wanted to tell. Uh, here's the second story I want to tell. And in a sense, it's, it's going to be kind of the same story. Um, but I think it again helps us to put the transcendental deduction into context. So let's think again a little bit about what happened in the metaphysical deduction. What happened in the metaphysical deduction? Okay, so we started thinking about the unity of judgment, right? In any judgment, concepts are brought together into a unity. And so what Kant did was he analyzed the ways in which a judgment can create a unity, in which there can be a synthesis of concepts into a judgment. And this led us to the table of the 12 functions of judgment. And then Kant went a step further and he said, okay, that is nice, but now, I mean, let us not consider judgment sort of in general, but let us consider judgment about objects, right? Let us consider judgment, the understanding in its objective use, right? When we apply it to, to things that are actually given to us, right? To objects. And Kant has told us that that will generate the categories. So one way to understand the metaphysical deduction is the following. It is like as if Kant said, well, if the understanding is to be applied to objects, then a priori, we can know that such application is going to involve the categories. But if the understanding is to be applied to objects, then we can know a priori that that is going to take the shape of the use of the categories in judgment. Nice. But this is an if-then claim, right? And we haven't seen anything that proves the if. We haven't seen any proof that the understanding is going to be applied to objects, or that if we try to apply it to objects, that, it is, that this is in any sense legitimate. Right, that we can apply it to objects, that applying it to objects would not amount to, you know, something that is totally fake, um, like totally empty, doesn't really touch those objects, could never lead to, to real cognition or knowledge of the objects. And so what we need, again, is we need to show the legitimacy of applying the understanding to objects. And because objects are given to us in intuition, in sensibility, of course, this comes down to the same thing, right? Building this bridge between on the one hand sensibility and on the other hand, the understanding, bringing them together, showing that it is legitimate to use the pure concepts of thinking of the understanding on the objects given to us in intuition. All right, so when we come to the transcendental deduction, uh, to the first section, on the principles of a transcendental deduction in general, this is sort of the story that Kant is going to try to tell us. He's going to try to explain to us why it is so important that we do this transcendental deduction. So he tells us that with the pure concepts of the understanding, and now I am at A88 or B120, with the pure concepts of the understanding, however, there first arises the unavoidable need to search for the transcendental deduction, not only of them, but also of space, and presumably of time. Um, for since they speak of objects, not through predicates of intuition and sensibility, but through those of pure a priori thinking, they relate to objects generally without any conditions of sensibility. And since they are not grounded in experience and cannot exhibit any object in a priori intuition on which to ground their synthesis prior to any experience, they not only arouse suspicion about the objective validity and limits of their use, but also make the concept of space ambiguous by inclining us to use it beyond the conditions of sensible intuition. Uh, so Kant is actually, he's drawing a contrast here. 
um, between a couple of different ways of using you know, a couple of different kinds of concepts and why some of them might seem to be more problematic than others. So the space and time, certainly space was Kant's example here when he talks about geometry. Uh, he thinks it, if we're just doing geometry, we're never going to run into real trouble because geometers just create in intuition their own objects. Right? When I think about a triangle, I'm creating in intuition, in pure intuition, this, this object, the triangle. Um, and so I'm always in touch with the object. Right? There's really no way things can go wrong. I can't end up misusing my concepts, using them where they can't be applied in geometry, in mathematics in general. So that's not a problem. Um, so that is why Kant says that if you can exhibit any object in a priori intuition on which to ground your synthesis prior to any experience, then you're not in trouble. But we can't do that when it comes to the pure concepts of the understanding. Because they don't, I mean, we, we, we cannot sort of create causation or, or any of the other categories in intuition. Right? They're not... They don't describe our intuition. Uh, they're, they're, they come from the understanding. They're also not grounded in experience, right? It's not like the concept of red. Right? We can't really worry about the application of the concept of red in a sense, because why mean if you do worry about it? Well, here, oh yeah, okay. There's an object. It's red. Nice. This is just an, an empirical concept. It comes from us through experience. Um, it can't be a priori, and so we don't have like the 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 problem of showing that it's a priori valid. It isn't a priori valid, and we don't think that it's a priori valid, and so we don't have to prove that it's a priori valid, right? There's no, there's no problem there. So when we think about empirical concepts, we don't have to show that they're a priori valid. When it comes to like the use of concepts in mathematics, there's also no problem because their a priori validity is always grounded in the fact that we can just create the objects that they apply to in intuition. But what we are doing here in transcendental philosophy is we are thinking about how concepts apply to objects that cannot be given, well, that that are not given sort of in, in pure intuition, that we're not constructing for ourselves. Um, we're, we're trying to understand how, we're trying to understand in a priori sense how the a priori concepts of the understanding will apply to any object that could be given to us, right? And this is a very different thing. This is a very different project. And it's a project that is going to involve us in difficulties that these other projects do not. In fact, these difficulties are apparently for Kant such that we now even have to, to sort of worry about space and time themselves, right? Because as soon as we take up space and time into general thinking, there is this possibility suddenly to not just apply them to this spatial thing that I create in intuition, like this triangle, uh, or this spatial thing that I find in, in empirical sensation, the pencil, um, but to apply them to objects in general, right? And to wonder whether like the soul is spatial or whether God is in time or things like that. Um, and that might get me into trouble. And so that is why I need to find out where space and time can actually be legitimately applied. Well, they can actually be legitimately applied when it comes to objects of experience. And that is what, well, objects in intuition. So it's gonna turn out objects in experience. Um, and that is of course what we learned in the transcendental aesthetic. Right, so Kant is not actually going to do a transcendental deduction here of the concept of space or the time because he has already done that, right? He has already shown their legitimate, uh, the, 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 the limits of their legitimate application. He's here sort of pointing out why this was even necessary. Okay, so we need to do something, right? We need to show that the pure concepts of the understanding can be legitimately applied and we need to show where they can be legitimately applied. One thing we might wonder at this point, at this stage, is whether they can legitimately be applied 
only to objects of experience or also to things in themselves, right? There's really nothing in the critique so far which shows us one or the other. And of course, one of the things that transcendental deduction is going to do is it's going to show us that they only apply to objects given in experience. And it's going to show us that they do apply to objects given in experience, right? So both these things, Kant needs to do both these things, show that the a priori concepts of the understanding apply only to objects given in experience. That's one thing we're going to be shown. And that's going to be important for the critical project for the second half of the book, especially. Um, but even more importantly, what he needs to show is that, that they actually do apply to objects of experience, which is not evident. So that is what Kant is going to insist on here. So at A89, B112, Kant tells us this. The categories of the understanding, on the contrary, do not represent to us the conditions under which objects are given in intuition at all. Hence, objects can indeed appear to us without necessarily having to be related to functions of the understanding, and therefore without the understanding containing their a priori conditions. Thus, a difficulty is revealed here that we did not encounter in the field of sensibility, namely, how subjective conditions of thinking should have objective validity, that is, yield conditions of the possibility of all cognition of objects. For appearances can certainly be given an intuition without functions of the understanding. So Kant is here maybe not expressing the conclusion that we will have to reach at the end of the transcendental deduction, um, but certainly expressing something that would seem to be the case. It would seem to be the case that objects can be given to us in intuition um, that don't fall under the functions of the understanding at all. I mean, why not? The forms of intuition are space and time. Okay, so what? What does that have to do with any of the categories? Right? It doesn't seem to have anything to do with any of the categories. Um, and so there seems to be this almost terrible possibility that our concepts, our categories, just have no application whatsoever. Um, okay, Kant is going to go on, and he says, a little bit lower, for that objects of sensible intuition must accord with the formal conditions of sensibility that lie in the mind a priori is clear from the fact that otherwise they would not be objects to us. Right? For sensibility, this is kind of clear. That is why we didn't have this difficulty in the aesthetic but that they must also accord with the conditions that the understanding requires for the synthetic unity of thinking is a conclusion that is not so easily seen. For appearances could, after all, be so constituted that the understanding would not find them in accord with the conditions of its unity, and everything would then lie in such confusion that, for instance, in the succession of appearances, nothing would offer itself that would furnish a rule of synthesis, and thus correspond to the concept of cause and effect, so that this concept would therefore be entirely empty, nugatory, and without significance. Appearances would nonetheless offer objects to our intuition, for intuition by no means requires the functions of thinking. So again, Kant is, he is painting for us this specter almost, this danger, that we could, we can sort of imagine at least, the possibility that our experience just doesn't allow us to apply any of these concepts. That it is kind of a, a chaos from the point of view of our understanding, a chaos that resists any attempt to think it through concepts. Okay, um, hopefully that's not the case. And hopefully the objects that are presented in intuition do in that we can in fact know a priori that they will fall under the concepts. But of course, we don't know that yet. Okay, we then come to sort of a new section within this section called the transition to the transcendental deduction of the categories. Here, Kant brings in, he's going to emphasize the notion of an object and he is going to bring in the notion of experience. And for Kant, experience is something a little bit more than just the intuition of an object. Uh, experience means that we 
that objects are given to us in such a way that we can actually sort of think them, bring them together, uh, learn something from it, get to knowledge and cognition of them. And so experience is a little bit stronger than just something that ex is exhibited or given or presented in intuition. So Kant is going to talk about, you know, what is necessary for something to even be an object of experience. Right? What is necessary for something to even be an object of experience? Okay. That's my son. Um, the representation is still determinant of an object a priori if it is possible through it alone to cognize something as an object. So this is a phrase from B125, A92. The representation is still determinant of the object a priori if it is possible through it alone to cognize something as an object. How could we know that any concept applies a priori to the objects given to us in intuition. Well, Kant seems to say here, suppose that a certain concept lies a priori in our cognition of something as an object, right? Suppose that a certain concept is necessary to even think something as an object of experience, as something that stands over and apart from, you know, our purely subjective mental life and is something that we could have knowledge about, right? Something that has objective reality. If certain concepts belong a priori to the notion of... belong a priori to the notion of, um, <laughs> of an object of experience, then we could know a priori that they will apply to every object of experience. Right, so the thought here is pretty simple. If certain concepts belong to the very notion of, or the very way that something could be thought as an object for us, then we can know a priori that they belong to any object of experience. Okay, so this sort of gives us a first clue into the direction in which Kant is going to go, right? The, what the transcendental deduction is going to involve is it is going to involve thinking through the relation between a subject, we, and an object. It's going to involve thinking through this subject-object relationship and trying to find out what conceptually is presupposed a priori in the very grasp of ourselves as subjects represented with these objects of cognition. And what Kant is going to have to try to do is he's going to have to try to show that this very notion of the subject-object relationship as it applies to us will involve or will um, is such that the categories can be known to apply a priori to all the objects that can be given in experience. So, the question now is whether a priori concepts do not also proceed as conditions under which alone something can be, if not intuited, if not intuited, because Kant has just told us that, you know, merely to merely intuit something that, that doesn't yet require concepts. But maybe there are a priori concepts that proceed as conditions under which alone something can be, if not intuited, nevertheless thought as object in general. For then all empirical cognition of objects is necessarily in accord with such concepts, since without their presupp presupposition nothing is possible as object of experience. Now, however, all experience contains, in addition to the intuition of the senses, through which something is given, a concept of an object that is given in intuition, or appears. Hence, concepts of objects in general lie at the ground of all experiential cognition as a priori conditions. Consequently, the objective validity of the categories as a priori concepts rests on the fact that through them alone is experience possible. <laughs> 
And so the transcendental deduction of all a priori concepts has a principle toward which the entire investigation must be directed, namely this, that they must be recognized as a priori conditions of the possibility of experience. Concepts that supply the objective ground of the possibility of experience are necessary just for that reason. So let's read that sentence again. Concepts that supply the objective ground of the possibility of experience are necessary just for that reason. And here, I mean, this word objective, and I'm, I'm going to stress this again and again, I think, um, it's not just like a, the weak sense in which we sometimes use it, like it's, oh, it's not just subjective, it's objective. It really means like pertaining to objects, right? So the objective validity, the objective ground of the possibility of experience really has to do with the possibility of experience being about objects, uh, of there being objects of experience. If there are any concepts that supply this objective ground of the possibility of experience, then they are necessary. Right? Then we can know that they do apply a priori, necessarily, to all objects of experience. And so this is what the transcendental deduction will have to investigate. Okay, this first section of the deduction uh, ends differently in the A and the B version, but what we read there is pretty much like, um, well, certainly what we read in the A version, where Kant says, oh, there's sense, imagination, and apperception, and on these are grounded the synopsis of the manifold, the synthesis of this manifold, the unity of this synthesis. Wow, we have no, no idea what he means, right? And he's going to explain that later. So we can sort of safely read through that, say, okay, Kant, uh, and go on. Uh, in the B edition, Kant takes some time to discuss Locke and Hume and say where they went wrong uh, and how his own, uh, his own way of thinking is going to, to improve on them. Uh, and again, he's going to give us some, some, some like a, a, a little bit of a, um, an idea of what he might be going to do. But we will talk about what he's going to do in the B deduction when we come to the B deduction. Okay, so that is the first section. And then next time, we are going to look at the second section as we find it in the A deduction.